And hello, everybody. It's Tuesday again. You know what it means. I'm Landon Wright. Hope you're all having a great week so far. Media director here at HowChurch.net. This is How Table Talk. And, of course, join with me across the table again for the fourth week in a row. My new co-host. It's official now. We've made it four weeks. Yes, Mr. Pastor KD. Pastor, how you doing today? I'm doing good, man. How about you? Oh, it's good to have you. Always good to have you because I know you. It's a beautiful day, too, isn't it? Well, you know, I'm digging this long sleeve weather. You know, it's finally back. It's yeah. got that brisk cool going on out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of the day, you've been all over the place today talking to different people about different important things involving the church and all that and helping people out. So thank you for taking another little half hour out of your busy week to come in here and hang out. So today, you know, we've been talking about how to, how to you know, I don't want to sound too judgmental, but how to improve parts of your life in the workplace and the church yeah. as a church family member not just someone that goes to church well today folks this is something you can really use because it's something i still need help on actually we kind of all still need help on and that's finances we're going to start a little two episode maybe three episode series this is the first one today we're going to talk about finances but not so much what i think you should do with your money because don't listen to that uh, and not exactly, you know, not 100% what he thinks you should do with your money, but really what the Bible says exactly. you should do with your money. And I know what you're thinking. That's going to be so abstract and drawn. Actually, no, because it, it specifically talks about financial skills in the Bible. Of course, they don't say dollars and cents because that didn't exist yet, but you know what I'm saying. So, uh, so. Have you seen that without someone having to point it out to you? Have you been reading, the, or, or like when you were coming up through the rankings in ministry, did, it, did, you, did that jump out at you? Like, whoa, that's obviously talking about money. No, not really. Honestly, you always think when, you know, you're in the church setting, you always think about tithes and offerings. So I always heard about tithes and offerings, but I never understood uh, through a biblical perspective exactly, you know, all the principles that were in the Bible. And then I found out as I delved off into it and began to minister and learn and study that God actually taught more about money in the Bible and talents than he did heaven or hell. And it, it's, I think it's simply because of all the things that come with it, the blessings, and if you will, unfortunately, the curses of we mishandling our money. So I never really looked at it through the money perspective. I was just saved on fire uh, for God, love God, love people. I was wanting to win someone's soul. I, I didn't know you needed money. Yeah. <laughs> the cash was a bonus, yeah. cash bonus. Yeah. Well, our first uh, question, loose question, if you will, um, I want to say that, you know, in Proverbs 24, 27, it says, prepare, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field so basically folks what that's saying is uh you know you want to prepare your field your crops before you start worrying about your house you know that was only part of the verse uh, that wasn't it but uh but yeah you know you it, it, it basically says take care of the field take care of the crops and then worry about getting a nice living space and all that and i know what you're thinking like i kind of want somewhere to sleep at night but when you break it down what i got out of that was you know, what good's a house if you can't put food on a table? Or what good's a house if you can't afford the bills? You know, so, yeah. so, so yeah, unless you're a farmer, it's not literally going to mean field, but it means, you know, make something of yourself. Get your education or get your job legs under you before we start worrying about a big apartment or a pool or a jacuzzi or any of those things. So uh, so my real question is, is when we start breaking down our essentials, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of things that are important. I mean, we need things now that you didn't necessarily need 20 years ago, yeah. like cell phones. You know, when they first come out, they were just kind of something cool to have. Well, if you don't have a cell phone now, you're in a bind, a big one. So, and, and if you just have a flip, now you're in a bind, because now you pretty much need a smartphone to navigate. So, so how do we... How do we, you know, what's the thing, you know, when you're breaking out your essentials and it all seems essential, what do you really look for? I think you look for your essentials and define what those are because I think there's our wants and there's our needs. And I think God said he'll supply all of our needs and not our greeds. Now, it's not that he doesn't want us to have things. He just doesn't want things to have us. And there's a big difference. And uh, we need to learn to worship the blesser and not the blessings. And what we have a tendency to do is care more about 
what we can get instead of what we can give. But what that word prepare means is just what it means. It means that you're setting in motion things now to be able to reap a harvest in the future. Now, let me just say this. It's not original with me. I'm a big John Maxwell fan. He said it before that in life you're going to pay. So you got to decide if you're going to play now and pay later, right? Or are you going to pay now and play later? But make no mistake about it, in life you pay. Now what I have done early in my years, because I was a novice and, and didn't know and, and just immature and many other <laughs> deficiencies I can talk about in my life, is that you think play, 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 but when you get older, you realize that that lack of preparedness that we're talking about is costing you. And uh, the older you get, you realize that playing at an early age wasn't the most um, wisest thing to do. It wasn't the wisest thing to do because when you get older, it's not you're preparing necessarily for retirement. But you are putting up, if you will, for the future, for medical expense, unexpected deaths and loss and things of that sort. And we could go on and elaborate on all those things. But you just play, spend all your money, waste all your time. And then if you're not careful when you get older, you're deciding between uh, medicine and food now. Because now I don't have a retirement. I'm 55, 65 years old. The way it looks, I'm going to have to work for the next 20 years if I live because I still got a house note, I still got a truck note, I still got all these things that I need to pay for because I played when I was younger. Now, do we, should we have a good time? Yeah. Should we play? Yes. But blessed be the balance, I say. So you're going to pay a price. Why not pay it when you're young and full of zeal and energy? Uh, why not? Enjoy your, the fruits of your labor when you get old instead of having a labor, 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 hardly, hard, all your life. Now, God wants us to work, and there's no, no such thing as retirement in the Bible. But at the same time, there's more options for you. If you pay now, there's more options for you in the future where you're very limited if you're not wise with money. So... We didn't go on a tangent, but what we were talking about is preparation. So right now, get all the education you can get. Learn, study, work hard, pay the price, work real, real smartly as well so that those options will be available in the future because of your preparation here. But you're going to pay. Why not pay when you're young and play a little bit more when you're older? You know, uh, that is a concept that um, I learned the very hard way by, by living it. Um, in college, you know, all my friends, they were wanting to, you know, go to concerts and all that and take these road trips, and that's awesome, that's fun, you know, and then, you know, I wanted so bad to be a part of that so I'd have these cool memories because I was looking at it in the way of, yeah, I recognized you got to pay and play, but I was like, man, as soon as college is over, the real world starts, and all I'm going to be doing from the time I'm like 25 to an old man is working. So I'm going to have as much fun as possible now so that I can go ahead and get locked into work mode. Yeah. But what was happening was, you know, I was sometimes getting behind on rent. Uh, any of my ex-roommates, sorry, uh, you know, getting <laughs> behind on rent, utilities and all that, and it's prioritizing, but I was just like, you know, I'm okay with being broke and getting and all this. If I can just have my fun, well, then now looking back on it, I still have those fun memories. I got pictures and all that, but I only remember a few of them. You're not going to remember all that. So, I mean, you know, why why break your neck trying to do something, you know, once in a lifetime chance, but are you really going to be able to enjoy it? Like, do you have the gas to get there? Do you have the gas to get back? You know, those kind of things. So, you know, it, and, and the more money you make, the, the temptation doesn't go away. You know, I've heard a lot of people say, hey, I'm just – living paycheck to paycheck. I could just get a better job, man. Things will be better. Well, they will, you know, because now you got more wiggle room here. But then that temptation kicks in of you got more play money to burn now. Yeah, And, and you'll know, go right back to living paycheck to paycheck. 
and the way you you spoke about you know i can i can do better things now it's not you know when you talk about better it's not you know don't wish things were better wish you were better and the better you become there comes that option again and let me just say this to all the the millenniums out there uh, when it comes to education i've heard this and i've said it before you know i got my education is why should i go to college i mean it's useless it's it's you know we don't use it or you know i could be doing something else i I don't see the benefits well what education does it opens more opportunities it seems like that's the word i didn't choose that word today but that's the word word that's coming up yeah so it opens up more opportunities for you now watch this if your education's right here it doesn't mean you're a dummy it doesn't mean you're not smart or nothing but unfortunately it limits many times not always but many times it limits your opportunity so the more educated you become and the more you know savvy you are and adept in the field that you are the more opportunities come available and um you know you're driving down the road and i would just say this when you're talking about money if you want to get better in money why not listen to seminars on money instead of listening to 105.5 you know, about a bunch of people who lost everything and going to lose everything. Why don't you just slide a CD in or, you know, now you can put it on your phone or whatever, Spotify, I don't know all the, the techie terms, but why don't you find something that talks about money and educate yourself for that 30 minutes? And uh, and then there, there, there comes them opportunities again because now you've ex- broadened your mind, you've expanded your thinking, then you can recognize an opportunity when it comes why because that verse said prepare you're preparing for something you're that means you're expecting something if i prepare something if i prepare a meal then guess what i'm preparing that meal so that i can partake of it i'm not preparing the meal hope i got something at the end so preparation is so important preparation is and opportunities but you know here's what you'll find Lucky things happen to people who work hard. Of course, we know there's no such thing as that. People that work hard, opportunities, find them, and they find opportunities. Absolutely. You know, so, folks, just to catch you up here, we were talking about uh, budgeting and uh, making that personal budget and, and, you know, setting your priorities. Not so much a budget, but, you know, setting your priorities. And what we just did was open a door. You know, that verse is, yes, talking about your priorities financially, the field and the house. But it's also talking about non-monetary things like your education. So prepare, prepare, prepare. Load up that toolbox full of tools now so you can use them later. Let, let, me, just, let me just piggyback off that thought because when, when I feel like we're in a vein that can really help somebody, I like to just, you know, extract and glean out of every single thing that we can. But, you know, it's ironic, and I shared this Sunday, that most people who live in homes over $250,000, they've got libraries. Now, what does that mean? If you go buy a bunch of books, you're going to have a big home? No, I don't think it's the collection of books that did it, but undoubtedly somebody has delved off and someone is studious and someone had began to read and learn and because they broaden themselves inwardly, watch this, you can't grow inwardly and things not change outwardly. If your business is not growing, if your finances is not growing, If your church is not growing, I know it's a work of God there now, so it is a little different there. But if you're growing inwardly, things outwardly has to grow. It just just dictates growth. But if you're not growing and learning about money and financing and budgeting and preparing, then guess what? The rain can rain, but you hadn't planted anything. God is only going to bless what you planted. You see, you got to plant it. And it says in Psalms 1 that, you know, when you walk with godly people and you do godly, uh, do things that are godly that God will bless. Notice that word, do. You got to do something. You got to plant something. And so when you prepare and when you budget, God can rain on it and he brings forth the fruit. But if he rains on what you've done right now, what have you done? And so let me give you an equation. I, I was real good in math. Nothing from nothing equals nothing. Okay, so 
you got to prepare. Yeah, so you see, folks, uh, the preparation and the budgeting, that kind of goes hand in hand. It does. You know? One, I mean, they're a little different because, one, you're preparing your education. You're, you're, you're getting that money ready to budget. Yeah. But when you budget, you know, it's like what we said earlier, you get a better job, more money. That don't mean you have more play money, you know. So the Bible also, you know, that I told you that Proverbs 24, 27, preparing the field before the house. Well, Luke 14, 28 through 30 I didn't have time to put the full verse on there, but the verse does say, you know, uh, you, only a fool starts building a statue without making sure they have the means to finish. They said when you start building the statue or the monument, you got to remember this is biblical times. We're talking Egyptian pyramids. Monuments were really in fashion back then. <laughs> so when you start building a giant statue, it said everyone passing by will see a halfway built statue and know that a fool started that because he did not have the means to finish. So that's what the Bible says about budgeting. It straight up says you're going to be a fool if you don't do it. And that's so true. Uh, and, and, you know, it's hard to make a budget for something that's really far off. I mean, like, for example, let's say you're uh, a young college freshman, about 18, 19 years old. It's really hard to start budgeting for your own house at 18 mm -hmm. because, you know, it seems like forever away. You're living in a dorm or an apartment, and that's comfy, and that's fine. Well, let me just tell you from experience the nice comfy trailer quit being so comfy <laughs> when all my friends had property now and I'm like oh yeah I mean I still got the man cave that's about it so yeah. so you know so you just got to remember it feels good now but it's going to change with your with what's going on around you don't want to be the odd man out so budgeting it's one of those things you know if the bible says do it do it but you know, it's one of those things you just have to believe it's important, even when it seems, I mean, am I even really going to want it? Well, hey, if you don't want it, guess what? Now you have like 20 grand or however much just sitting there you can do something else with, you know? It's called options. Options, yeah. You, that's, you, that's you, got, the you got two when you're broke. <laughs> you're broke or you can be broke, and that's your <laughs> options. Or broke or broker, that's your options. And let me just say something about budgeting. So how would one do budgeting? First of all, I'm not an authority on it. I deal with a little money. I built some stuff and all that. But there are so many more people that are so much more qualified than I when it comes to money and budgeting. But I can tell you a few little bitty nuggets, I think, that'll help you. And the first thing that many people don't want to do when they budget is put God first. Now, that's not a preacher talk. So what I would do if I received a check, the first thing I'm doing, I'm taking a tenth off of that. I'm going to give God a tenth. And then the second thing most people don't think about is I'm going to pay myself. I mean, I'm paying all these bills. I'm paying you. I'm paying him. I'm paying them. I'm paying. Why don't I pay myself? So what am I putting up? So I'm paying God first. I'm paying myself second. And then you've got to be able to budget for the future as well. What, what is it you're going to lay up? you know, for unexpected calls when it comes to surgeries, if you want a house, you know, you got electricity bills, you got food. And I'll just say this, Larry Burkett, is, he's, he's outstanding when it comes to how to budget. He's got workbooks. I would just ask you to get some of his stuff. Again, I'm not an authority, but I can tell you this, money is not just about us getting all we can canning all we get and sitting on the can god has made us stewards of that and if we put him first and we take care of what he's asked us to do you'd be surprised how many blessings are in it for all of us we get the blessings he gets the glory and so i would put god first i'd pay me and then i'd lay out a budget and it causes for you and i to be disciplined and that's the word we sacrifice the future right now on the altar of immediate. What we want to do is we want it now, we want it big, and we want it grand. And if we, we don't even think about can we afford it. You know, to go buy a new vehicle anymore, it doesn't take money, it just takes guts. Yeah. <laughs> they'll, sell, they'll sell a logging truck to a kindergarten, you know, if they can qualify. You know, so what I'm getting at is, you just want to be prepared, and you do want a budget. And when you can do a budget and stick with it, 
it's wonderful. But it, it's not thus saith the Lord. There's some people who just, there's no play in their life. And all they think about is money. Money should work for you, not you work for your money. Meaning money doesn't own you. You own the money. It's a horrible master, but it's an awesome awesome slave don't let it be your master just let it navigate let, uh, you navigate your money through the eyes of god and what god wants you to do with it you'll be fine now that's simplified but that's fine you know that, that you'll actually be fine. coincides with a really cool quote you said uh sunday during your sermon which by the way was a really good one uh, well, i can't believe you you've actually heard my sermon oh I'm, you know i mean i'm only you're so busy though you, you're back here doing lights and media and yeah. sound and so i'm glad that sometimes, you're getting fed sometimes there's a quote that penetrates all that confusion <laughs> i'm like whoa that was good and then go back to doing my lights well thank you <laughs> but anyways uh vocational health was the name of the sermon uh the links on the facebook we'll show it at you here later on but uh the thing is as you said uh <coughs> god gives us tools and money is a tool that's you know, what it is. Um, God gives us tools not to play with, but to build with. That's right. You said it just like that. And, folks, that's so true. You know, if God blesses you with excess money than what you need, it means you should budget it, put it up. But that don't mean be a tight wad. It means he's giving you that excess money because you can use it to help someone else. Now, that's there's exactly a lot of con right. men. There's a lot of people, you know. But uh, it's like how my great, or not my great, but but my grandfather, uh, when he passed away, you know, we knew that he was real generous and would help people. But there were so many more people at the funeral that came forward about when he helped with bills and stuff. I mean, we knew he did that a lot, but the actual number was like triple because he just wouldn't tell anybody. I yeah. mean, it's not his business to tell, you know, yeah. and, and that's that's. That was a perfect example, I think. He was a deacon in our old church and all that, you know, a perfect example. But but that's how that should that's how that should be. You know, God's given you the tools to build with. Now that don't mean go build it and be like, Hey, check it out. You know, yeah. it just means hey, do it, move on, he'll bless you. So yeah. moving on to our next question here. Ecclesiastes, that's a that's a hard one to say there, but Ecclesiastes 11.2 says, invest in seven ventures. Now, real quick, I want to say it's no shock that it says seven ventures. I'm uh, not exactly sure the reason why, but you know, you know, the number seven shows up in the Bible a lot. That's yeah. that's God's number. So uh, seven ventures. Now, it says do that, and now it's saying tie your money up in different things. So let's say, for example, um, Okay, uh, you work, uh, you own a chain of grocery stores, you're in the grocery business. All you've ever done is grocery business. Well, what if something happens at the corporate level of that grocery store, and now your location, your Brookshire's or Super One or whatever gets shut down, well, what else have you been doing with your money? Do you have it in stocks? Have you, have you helped somebody start a startup business and you're clearing half the profit? I mean, what are you doing to make your money make you more money. And you can't just put all your eggs in one or two baskets. The Bible says seven. Now, realistically here, you know, not everybody can invest in seven different things. But what it's just saying is multiple, okay? Don't put it all in one or two. Like me, for example, my main source of income is doing this. Uh, then, you know, I, I like to help people out if they give me a little money for some odd jobs or using my DJ and, and tech expertise to help them set something up. You know, maybe I don't really count that as a source of income. My main income is here. And then, you know, you got odd job cash. And then, but what I do is once a month, this is just how I do it. Uh, you know, I recommend that you meet with a professional. And by the way, next episode, we will have a finance uh guru in here uh, not going to spoil who but we will have our first official guest next episode but uh, how I do it is once a month I take $200 out of my paycheck and I give it to my broker I let him do everything for me because I don't understand stocks but I know he does and uh, he's a guy I've known for a long time I trust him he's not just you know somebody in a suit that I hired you know he's a friend and um, so I give him that money. He tells me what's going on. If there's a risk going on, he'll call me and just be like, all right, so your chances of coming out of this are good, but I'm not pulling the trigger to, you know, and all that kind of thing. So 
So find somebody that's a professional, but the stock market is always a good place to start, if you ask me. Yeah, it goes up and down, and it changes like the weather, but at the end of the day, if you got somebody you trust to know what they're doing, you can always pull out and just go back in, you know. So, uh, so with you, um, I'm not, I don't know if you've ever done stocks or anything like that, but just investments in general. If you're getting ready to invest in something, what are some key things, just the basic core pillars that people need to be educated on, whether that be trusting people or whatever? Well, if you want to invest, the thing that I would say to invest in is invest in something that's going to last forever, and that's souls. And that's just not preacher talk. That's a fact. And uh, the Bible says the world is going to pass away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of the Father abides forever. And um, it's amazing to me how many people trust the stock market. And, uh, you know, we have a little bit in there, and, and people entrust investments, but, you know, to trust in God. We'll put it on our money. We'll wear our little bracelets and we'll wear our little necklaces and our T-shirts. He can do the impossible. But even though we have to have business sense, and I do and others do, and the people that's listening, they do, they have business sense, we got to have, we gotta have God sense too. And, and so one of the things that I would say is that invest in eternity a little bit because uh, that's kind of like what's going to last forever. And uh, when you invest in people and you love people and you give to people, and, and our church is incredible. I, I know people's going to think this is a sales pitch. It's just a fact. I can say it with confidence. This church has been the most selfless church I've ever pastored in 31 years. I've said it before. People has given money that even the congregation, the parishioners here don't know who's giving it. And they've given tens of thousands of dollars. And they don't ever want to be recognized or heard of, but they're investing. They realize, I got money, I got cars, I got trucks, all this is wonderful, and that's great, and, and that's wonderful. But they know that that's not fulfilling them, that's not filling the void. But what is, is when they give and they see, like Sunday, we had four or five saved, five saved Sunday. That's what, that's what makes them go forward. And, you know, Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, uh, that was the wisest man in the world. And you know what he did? You know how he became the wealthiest man in the world other than Jesus when he walked on the face of the earth? Is one day he prayed and he said, God, God asked him, he said, you, you ask me whatever you will and I'll give it to you. Listen to what I'm fixing to tell you now. This is God Almighty. Whatever you want, I, just, just ask. I, I, want, I want to see what you're going to ask for. That's my paraphrase. He said, God, give me wisdom. Watch this, that I might lead your people. And God says, because you seek first the kingdom of God, that's the New Testament version, everything will be added unto you. He ended up being the wealthiest. Now, you're talking about investments. You're talking about being prepared. You're talking about opportunities. His heart was to have wisdom to lead God's people. And God says, now, I'm going to give you more money than you can ever spend. They tell me that he had golden uh, horse stalls made out of gold. I mean, he was the wealthiest man, the wealthiest man ever. And yet, he said, all is vanity if you don't know Jesus and put him first. Even in this book, he said, it's all vanity. So he said, yeah, prepare in seven adventures. And yeah, don't, don't be so earthly minded, so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. But don't be so earthly minded, you're no heavenly good. Be balanced. Yeah, prepare, work, and, and make investments, and money's important. But what's more important, Solomon said, is when you put God first. And I'm telling you, people will do everything. They'll go to the casino. They'll do scratch-offs. They'll work till their liver's loose. Mm. They'll do every single thing. But trust the God who created this world. Really, man? Really? I mean, the one who was here before I was even thought about, trust him. The one that created everything. You think I'm going to trust him? But yeah. we'll trust this lotto. And, and I just want to say this. And casinos, because, you know, casinos were started to make everybody wealthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, lottos <laughs> was developed so that everybody could have plenty. Yeah, right. Everybody of Native American heritage. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, 
that that's the thing. You know, I think it, it it's easier or it's easy for us to get uh, into that hole because, yeah, we know God's there. But when when we're in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, middle of the life, and um, you know, you can't just text God and He texts back and you read clearly what He's saying. I mean, you got to put some effort into that. You know, I mean, you're asking the the end all be all, the ultimate you know thing you know a celestial power you're asking him to communicate clearly to our little you know tiny brains on this big rock floating around in space you know so so you know i mean it's like i said in a past episode folks you know people ask like well i mean i just wish god would just show up right now and just tell me what's up well you know sin could not exist in the presence of god and he loves us but we're still sinful creatures we would explode you know so so when god communicates with you you know i mean a lot of people get frustrated like you said you know you invest in uh, the eternal and then money will come like solomon well people pray hard they go to church they go to the bible study they help people they do all this and they're like well it ain't happening yet well you know it's not just gonna appear in your bank account god's probably gonna bless you with that by putting something on someone else's heart thinking you know yeah maybe we will try this and then bam job offer well, you well, know? well let me just say this you said about God's not going to text you well he's texted already here's a text 66 books full of text mm, there so it is. he has text so what does God think about it I don't yeah. have to pray about it I can read about it he's already texted me yeah. and, I, and I would just say this is that you know when, you, when you're looking at what God has and you're looking at money we're, we just have to be talking about money, but money's money. Here's the way I look at it. What if I give somebody, help somebody give $50 or I give 100 tithes or whatever? It, it, I'm just making the illustration here. I've got health. I've got health. I might not get it back in money. I might get it back in health. How many wealthy people you know that want to get all kind of surgeries done to them because they can't stand themselves? They, 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 they full of, we got a world full of empty people. And they've got plenty of money, can go anywhere, do anything. But, you know, sometimes you give and God gives you peace. And he gives you, uh, he doesn't sometimes, he always gives you peace and gives you joy. So money's money. It, if God makes my tires go longer than 30 miles or 60 miles. I mean, the Bible says that the children of Israel walked in their clothes and the shoes did not wear out. We always think if we give that we need to expect all this money to come back. What about happiness? What about joy? What about your kids getting saved? What about life? What about breathing? What about not having to pay for medicine? Those are, those are wealthy things. Those are things that money can't buy. So here's how rich you can say you are. You want to know how rich you are? I'm going to tell you, I know how rich everybody listening to me really, how rich you really are. You ready? It's what will you have that death can't steal. Mm. Mm. So you might think you own something. You might think you're wealthy. I might think I own something. But you know what? The only thing that really, the wealth that I really have is what, my, what death cannot steal. My kids are going to heaven the best I know, they told me. My wife's going to heaven. I'm going to heaven, and I believe my Maltese puppy's going to heaven. I don't care what y'all believe. <laughs> it, it, uh, that's a fact. I, I don't know about all dogs, but I believe <laughs> mine's going to be there. <laughs> mine's better than yours. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's a thing that, that I was just thinking about is, you know, you said, what do you have that death cannot steal? We've all heard the saying a million times, you can't bring money with you. But, I mean, we see it in plain reality. They don't necessarily tell you this when you watch it on TV or on the news. But look at all of these great past musicians that have passed away. I'm going to use one of my favorites as an example. <coughs> oh, easy there. Sorry about easy. that. Sorry about that. Sorry. We don't need to start wearing masks for this, do <laughs> <No>. we? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to use one of my favorite, Elvis Presley. I mean, that guy, if you look it up, he has sold more records now, both in life and in death, than any artist in the history of recorded music. So that's a, the, the ultimate accomplishment. He's probably been top by now, but anyways point is the man had everything he died in the late 70s and now all of that stuff it's still floating around you think he's still alive as soon as he died the minute he flatlined and all that all of that is now owned not by his family not by his wife and all that. it's owned by the record company so it's just going to shift to someone else it's not yours anymore the That's minute right. you die 
Elvis Presley might have well just been another poor boy from Tupelo, Mississippi again. You know, he went right back to the start because all of those, the gold chains, Graceland Mansion, all that, it's owned by the record company now. Yeah, and, and let me just say this. Everything before Elvis owned it, someone else did. And the word shift is right. You're going to leave it to someone. But I want to be clear on something when I say when we're talking about money. Money's not bad. I, it's not that we need to act as though if you're poor you're spiritual no you're just poor you're not you're not you're not spiritually rich because you're poor you don't go to heaven because you're poor and you don't go to hell believe it or not because you're rich <laughs> solomon was rich god's rich there's rich people that love god all i'm trying to communicate is not money's evil and if you are trying to be successful and you're trying to be wealthy that you're wrong I'm just saying make sure you keep your priorities straight. Seek first the kingdom of God because God gave some talents in the Bible and he gave one this amount and another that amount and another that amount. And notice what he said, the one, the one that had one talent, he come back and he said, what did you do with it? He said, oh, I buried it. I knew you were a hard man, and, but I had the one talent. You know what he called him? You wicked and lazy servant. He said, I didn't give you that dollar or that $10 or that $1,000 to do nothing with, I gave it so that you could multiply it. So here's what we do. We take what God's blessed us with, and we put it to work for His honor and His glory, and we use the money. We don't let money use us. We love people. Listen to me. We love people, and we use things. But most of the time, people buy things and they buy these things to impress, they buy things with money they don't have to impress people they don't like. And that's the <laughs> priorities that are all wrong. God says, I want to bless you. I want to give you. I just want to trust you with it. I want you to think about other people. I want you to put me first. And I, I want you to have a good life. But it ain't all about money. That money can transpire or not transpire, but that money can lend to you being a fulfilled person. And a joyful person. So it's all about making it work for you, not you working it for, you know, not working for it in the sense of letting it control you. Money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. That's right. That's it's what you do to get it. Yeah, that's it. So our last point here before we wrap her up for another week. Remember, folks, next time we're going to keep talking about finances, but we will have our first guest. Again, not going to spoil who, but this person, uh, you know, right now we're kind of attacking this from purely a Bible standpoint. Next time we're really going to get into the dollars and cents here. But this right here is really important right here. Number four, last point from Ecclesiastes. Again, there's that word again. Book 5, chapters 13 through 14, again, it just warns that uh, you need to put up for retirement. You need to watch out, not so much budgeting, put up for retirement at a young age, but it's saying take less risk the older you get. Okay, it says that uh, you don't want to be a fool and you don't want to have all this greed to where all of a sudden you are uh, ready to retire and all this. And here's a stat I saw, you know, Right now in this era, in this age, uh, statistically, human beings live longer than we ever have. And that makes perfect sense. You know, I mean, back in biblical times, they didn't have medical technology yet. I mean, you know, the, the average lifespan was not what it is now. The average lifespan in the U.S. is 85 years old. That's longer than it, But also it's saying that most people retire, most people retire around 65, 70. So that means you still have 15 to 20 years that you got to have money put up to live on. And uh, some, you know, and I'm not saying you're stupid for thinking this, but just people, I know I did until I actually learned how, so, until I actually got my first job or first big job and started looking at my pay stub, I was, I was thought, oh, you know, you retired. The government's like, all right, good job, here you go. No, 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 they're basically just paying you what you've paid them. They're just kind of putting it up for you. So work hard, put that money up, but then don't start, you know, well, I'm retired. I just bought a nice new house down there in Florida. Going to be playing golf every day. What about your kids, though? What are they going to inherit? Nothing, because you've spent their inheritance on your retirement and uh, vice versa. So uh, the big question here is uh, when you're being cautious, the older you get, and, and I don't just mean play spending, but like with your investments, with your risk taking, with all that, uh, uh, what's your advice on just kind of 
pulling back some of that drive because we're all we all have the drive to be the best we can be. But when when do you need or how exactly do you start pulling it back a little bit out of caution the older you get? Well, uh, be honest with you, I'm not there to be able to really speak intelligently to that. But I will say the first half of your life, you work on making all the money you can. And it seems like on the second part of your life, uh, people are doing all they can to get the, keep the money that they work for the first part of their life. So, you know, it, it, it's always that. And when you're speaking about inheritance and, and, and putting up, and, and managing your life so that when you get to that, that age where uh, your kids can have something. Um, I just pray for all the parents today. Uh, you know, what, what I think I see and I hope I'm wrong, these are things that pastors hope they're wrong about. It was just, it's just too much evidence there. I, I, it just seems like I don't know if parents want their kids to be as successful are more successful than they they are, and I'm not saying every parent, of course. I'm just saying I've I've seen those that maybe it's like I had to work hard for everything I I have, and you're gonna have to work hard for it too. Nobody gave me anything, and I'm not gonna give you anything. I can't tell people how to spend their money. I I can't tell people what all they should do, but I do know that. God says that when we do what he asks us to do, that we're laying up treasures in heaven. And um, I think that we need to be wise and we need to enjoy what we work for. And if we can leave our kids something, I think it's biblical. I think it's scriptural. I think it gives them a better start in life. And it helps them move through life better than what we did. I just don't know if... If it always works out to where when you leave them something that they appreciate it and they build on it. But I can tell you for as far as me and my house, that's what I can speak intelligently to is that I want my kids to be better than I was at my age, better moms, better dads, a better man, a better Christian. I want my kids to prosper. Uh, and, and that's not just uh, financially. I want them to be wise and I want them to be uh, very intelligent when it comes to the things of, of how to navigate through life. And, and uh, I want to be able to leave them something to where they can say, you know, my daddy, you know, laid up a foundation and laid up a, a storehouse, if you will, to bless me and my grandkids. But the greatest legacy that we can leave them is that not was daddy well liked or mama well loved in the community is did, did they teach us the word of god and then they did they make god the priority of their life and that's the greatest inheritance that you can leave your kids in legacy is that mom and daddy love god and they showed us how to love god and love people and if you leave them 60 trillion dollars boy they, they can do a lot of fun stuff with that but they too must come to their end and they too will have to shift everything that they've accumulated to somebody so there's no u-haul behind a hearse mm -hmm. but boy you can sure lay up some treasures in heaven right here and the only thing i find going to heaven are souls so invest in your kid's soul teach them to invest in other people's soul and lay up something so when you get to heaven you're not sheepishly looking at Jesus when he says, how'd you do, uh, serve it? You, know, hmm. you don't want to say, well, I was a lazy rat and got all I can, can all I got and sat on the can. You want to say, Lord, I wasn't the best. And I made many mistakes, but you want to be able to say, this is my family, if that's possible. You know, I know everybody, well, you won't recognize, and I, whatever. But I want to be able to know that I've invested in souls. And that's what I would say. Money's important. And I'm going to leave them what I can. But souls are the most important. A lot of uh, big influential non-evangelical, you know, non, I'm not going to say non-Christian, but non-ministry uh, celebrities uh, do believe in that kind of thing. And it works. It really is true. Uh, I'm going to use an example here real quick. Uh, one of my favorite uh, show hosts is uh, Gordon Ramsay, famous chef. A lot of people know him for 
having some foul language, but they bleep him. They bleep him. But uh, anyways, Gordon, at the end of the day, you know, he's known for being this big, crazy, foul-mouthed chef, but, in, but outside, you know, away from the camera, that's not how he really is, you know. But he is a stern guy. And he says that, you know, he's got all this money. When he takes his family on vacation, he pays for the whole thing. The kids get to do everything and all that. But his kids sit and coach. Him and his wife fly, fly first class. And his kids are like, why? And he says, well, you haven't worked to earn that. I've worked. I've earned first class. You're getting to go on this free trip. What else do you want? And he says that when he dies, his kids will inherit, uh, you know, his, his contacts. They have his last name. They have his legacy. And they'll have, you know, their essentials taken care of. But as far as his fortune, that's going to go to the Gordon Ramsay Foundation, which is a charity. Yeah. He says that, he said, I had to work from the ground up to get all this money. My kids aren't just going to get it. They're going to get my last name. They're going to get my business contacts. And that should be all you need. Well, you know, I, I, before time runs out, because we are out of time, is that, bef I think that's great, the, the, the that he thinks the way of, of making his kids be productive in society because God, you know, he was the first one that worked. He planted a garden, and uh, he asked us to join in on that work. And work is not a result of the fall. It's a result of, of creation. It was something that we get to do. It builds self-esteem and, and uh, self, you know, awareness and things of that sort that, that makes us who we are. But I, I, I'd be remiss if I wouldn't bring this up. I just want to say to everyone, uh, this is not planned. I don't have a script. I got a piece of paper, but I don't have scripted out answers. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing with you from my heart. Uh, the questions are scripted out. I read them about three minutes, five minutes before we got in here. Uh, but I want to say to you that if you give a dollar or you give a million, both of those are so important when you give them to God because every soul I tell our church is, Every soul that gets saved is a result of your giving. So you're laying up eternal, eternal things when you invest in souls. And, you know, preachers are bad if we're not careful talking about, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't want money and, and uh, you know, money's evil. But then they stand up there and they'll say, hey, we need you to give. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to give. It's evil any other time, but it's not evil right now. We need it. <laughs> I want you to know it's not evil, and, and I want you to know it's, it's this, is that we thank God that God has blessed you in such a way, but more importantly, I thank God that you release those thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And a lot of people will say this, listen, when it comes to money. They'll say, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give what he gives too. But the fact of the matter is they won't give ten dollars right now out of a hundred and and the reason why they wouldn't give it if they had a million because they won't give the ten out of a hundred if you can't give on a little you won't be able to give on a lot because it has a way of tethering itself to us it, it has a way of attaching itself and and i'll say this in closing that when it comes to money that we need to hold on to everything that god's blessed us with with an open hand and uh, one thing I know about God is that he owns it all. And really, he just wants to see how well we can manage it. And you've been faithful over a few things with that $10. I might boost you up to 1000 because I can trust you with it. But if I can't trust you with $100, why would I trust you with a million? So, as, it, you know, that's just something that, that I felt I needed to share. It, it's not what we intended on talking about but i feel like somebody's going to hear this and it's going to rattle the ra rafters of their heart and it's going to make a difference hey man feel free to throw those nuggets of wisdom out there anytime yeah. you got them but anyways that wraps it for another week thank you again pastor for taking time out of your very busy schedule looking forward to doing it again remember guests next time can't wait for that we're going to wrap up our talk on finances again until then folks be sure you come by see us on a sunday that is sunday mornings 9 o'clock a.m. 10.30 a.m. right here on Highway 28 East in Pineville. And if you live a few states away, it's all right because we got it on live stream. You can check it out on Facebook and, and YouTube. And we're what? Howchurch.net. <laughs> not dot com, dot net. Everybody have a blessed week. We'll see you next time. Yes, thank you.